the goal of Git bisect is to help user find the first bad commit. And uh, this is done by using a kind of binary search for efficiency on the graph, on the commit graph. And uh, why is it interesting? It's because uh, you, when you find the first bad commit, you have just a few, hopefully, a small number of lines of code to, to check to find the bug, hopefully, instead of the full software. And uh, also, the commit gives some extra information, like uh, the commit author and the, the message, the commit message, the date, and things like that. Oh, sorry. And um, I will use the Linux kernel as an example because it's a very big code base with many users, many different developers. It has been developed for a very long time. And, uh, and, well, and I will talk a little bit about the development process of the Linux kernel. So there is a two weeks long merge window where uh, new features are integrated. And then there are eight, around eight uh, RC releases RC release to find bugs and especially regressions. And um, they are one week apart. And after that, there is a release and then some other stable release and distribution dis distribution maintenance and uh... okay so uh, Ingo Moldnar is a is a Linux kernel developer and he uses git bisect a lot he say he uses it uh, on average once per day uh, which is uh, quite a lot and he uses mostly on, uh, during the merge window so because the influx of bugs is the highest. And this means that you, you have to find regressions all the time, not only during beta or RC release, as you know. And uh, so good tools are needed anyway. And what tools are available? The regular tools to find bugs, of course, but also test suites and tools like Git Bisect. So, we will see mostly test suite and git bisect. And test suites are very useful because they prevent regressions from happening in the first place. And also because you, you are sure to have an, uh, a great amount of testability and functionality all the time. But they are not enough in some cases, for example, if you find a regression after a release, uh, then you, the, your test suite is not enough to find the first bad commit easily. And also, there is a combinatorial explosion problem uh, because with test suite, because it's difficult to, to, to test everything, especially for big software that has many different configurations and um, because you can see that uh, the, if you have big N configurations, big N tests and big, N, big C new commits, then uh, you have to perform a really big amount of tests if you, if you really want to test everything. So we saw that uh, test suite needs a tool to efficiently find the first bad commit and a strategy to fight combinatorial explosion. But, but now let's see how git bisect is used. So there are basically two ways to, to start it and bound it to bisect on a smaller part of the graph. So you can do it in three steps, like, like this, or just in one step, like this. Uh, here you just say git bisect start, and then you give a, f a bad commit and some good commits. 
And uh, for example, with uh, the, it's a toy example with the Linux kernel. You, you can start it like that. And uh, so you give the git basic start, then the bad commit, then the good commit. And it says that there are roughly 14 steps after this one. And it check out a commit that you have to test. And uh, so if you do it manually, you, you test by yourself the, the, the software that has, the, the, the source code that has been checked out. And then you tell git bisect whether what has, the commit that has been checked out is good or bad. For example, if it's bad, then you use git bisect bad. And then you have 13 steps left. And this is the next commit that will be tested. And so you start again to test until git bisect. And in the end, uh, hopefully, you find the first bad commit, this one. And uh, it gives you uh, some information about this commit. So you have the author, date, commit message, and the files. Uh, so after that, you, you can use the, the, the first bad commit as you want. And then to reset by section, you use git by sec reset. So this was a manual process because at, at each step, you had to manually build and test your, your software. But there is a way to, to tell git by sec that it can run a, com a command or a script called the run script to, that will uh, tell git bisect if the current commit is good or bad. So for example, if you want to bisect a broken build, you just have to use git bisect run make if, you, if make is a build command. And uh, for the previous example, so we start like previously, and then we say git bisect run. So this is a toy example. Here we just try to find sublevel equal 25 in the make file. So it runs the command you passed it, then it check out the, 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 the commit to test, it runs the command to test the commit, and so on, automatically. So, and in the end, you, here, uh, you find the first bad commit like previously. And it say it was a success. So how does uh, git bisect knows if the git bisect run knows if it's good or bad? It's using the, the exit code of the, of the run script. So zero means good. Uh, from 1 to 127, it means bad, except for 125, which means keep. And uh, after 128, it means stop. So skip marks a commit as untestable. And this means that git bisect has to choose another commit to, t to be tested and stop stops everything. So a few words about untestable commits. So in, if you manually bisect, then, and you, and you have to test a commit that you cannot test, for example, if it doesn't build, then you have to use either something to show you the, the graph and to let you pick the commit you want to test by yourself, or you can say git bisect skip, which is the same thing as when the run script exits with 125. But anyway, what can happen is that sometimes your, your currently good and currently bad commits are separated only by untestable commits. And uh, this means we, that 
git bisect will exit with something like this, telling you that it cannot be bisect more because of untestable commits. Okay, so a few words about git bisect log to save a bisect log and git bisect replay to replay it. And we are finished with git bisect commands. So then the, the bisection algorithm is used to find the best bisection commit. Um, so it's a truly stupid algorithm according to Linus Torvalds, but it, who created it, but it works very well. And um, it's not sim symmetric because it uses only one current bad commit and many good commits. And uh, there are two rules to bound the graph uh, at each step. So first, you, you have to remove all the commits that don't have the bad commit as an ancestor. And then you have to remove all the ancestors of the good commits. And this has some pitfalls because um, sometimes you have, you have, so these are the commits that are removed because they are not ancestors of the bad commit. And these are the commits that are removed because they are ancestors of the good commit. But you can see here that X, Y, and Z are not removed, and so it can uh, be quite sur surprising because sometimes here you will have, for example, version uh, 6, and here version 7, and here you will have version 5 because version 6 was created here. And so it can be, can be surprising, but it's quite natural if you think about it. And um, a few words about the skip algorithm. Sometimes the, there are big areas with untestable commits, and you have to be careful not to try to test in these areas all the time, because otherwise it will be not efficient at all. So we use a pseudo-random number generator, but we favor commit near the best base section commit. And there is another interesting case where you know that a, a branch called main is good and a branch called dev is bad, for example. There, you cannot apply the base section algorithm as it is, because otherwise you will remove all these commits and so you will bisect on this. But what can happen is that the bug may have been fixed in the main branch already. And in this case, if you remove all these commits, you will find C as the first bad commit and this is wrong because it's A is the first bad commit. So what you have to do is you have to, in this case, when the when the good when some good commits are not ancestors of the bad commit, you have to test the merge bases. And um, if the merge bases is bad, well, you, the bash section will will stop with a message like this because. You, you cannot, well, here, if you want, you could try to find the, the fix between the bad and the good, but um, it's better to ask the user what he wants to do. So here, let's see a few tips you can use with uh, git bisect run. So we saw that you can easily bisect broken builds, you can easily bisect test suite, if you pass it the command that run your test suite, but it's more efficient if you just can use one test, not the full test suite as, at each step. And you can have some one-liners like this one, for example, where 
you run make, and if it fails, you just exit with 125 to mean to say that you cannot test and you have to skip the current commit. And afterwards, if you, if it make if make succeeds, then uh, you can test with something like this, for example. And uh, you can bisect performance regressions with a script like this one. Uh, so you run the your application in the background with the in person. You get it, its PID. You sleep for the normal time, and after this time, the application should have finished, so it should not exist anymore. And uh, if it exists. It's bad, and so you exit with one, and otherwise you exit with zero. And it was there was a, the, the, there has been it has been taken from a real world example. It's not just uh, made up. So again, uh, a few words from Ingo Molnar, and uh, so he says he has a fully automated. Uh, bisection script based on git bisect run and he uses it uh, automatically, fully automatically. It, it uh, builds and uh, then boot up a new kernel fully automatically. So uh, now let's see how you can integrate git bisect with other practices and first, uh, let's talk about general best practices that are, of course, small commits, no commits, that break things, and a good commit message, and things like that. Uh, you, of course, git bisect will be much more useful if you, you have a commit history like that. And also, merges. Uh, should be taken care because they are quite bug prone by themselves and they are much more bug prone when they are not uh, done correctly that, when, that is when there, there is a lot of code that is changed uh, on the, by the merge commit. So, uh, but Anyway, there are, there are ways to, to get around this problem. Well, you can use git rebase, or you can use short branches, which is quite easy with git, or topic branches, and integration branches where you prepare merges and, and you test. So now, uh, let's see how you can fight combinatorial explosion with git bisect. So, um, well, if you, we saw that so, sometimes there is a really big number of configuration. So what people do is that they don't test each commit on all the configurations. They just choose a few number of configurations and this means a number like that. And what you can do, too, is that you test with your test suite uh, only, not on all the commits, but only on a few number of them. For example, you can test every two weeks or every, or at beta <laughs> release and things like that. And so this means that you will add this number, which is not too big, and then when you find a bug on all the, the configurations, or at least on many more configurations, then you can, you can bisect, and it gives a small number too. So with this, this way you can do as if you, as if you tested for all the configurations, all the commits, and uh, so you can find more bugs more efficiently. So this means that test suites uh, make it easy to bisect because 
It's easy to write a new test case if you already have many. And they may, it maintains testability, so it also makes bisecting easier and more efficient. And Git bisect, in turn, makes it worthwhile to develop new test cases and to help overcome combinatorial explosion. So we can see that we have a virtuous cycle and uh, so if you don't use both git bisect and test suite, uh, I think you should have some questions that you can ask yourself. So, but what is more interesting is when you can adapt your workflow and uh, so you just write a new test in your test suite when you, you have a new bug, a new regression. You use git bisect run with this new test case and you fix the bug and commit both the fix and the test script. So uh, Andreas Eriksson reported some really good results result by using Git and adopting this workflow. And uh, so what you have to do if you want a good workflow is to use general best practices and take advantage of the virtuous cycle we saw. And um, what is interesting too is that Git Bisect can be used not only by developers, it can be used by QA people or end users if they have access to the, to the source code. So it can be very interesting to, and it, what is interesting is that you don't have, in this case, you don't have to replicate the environment where the bug happens if the user or the QA guy can, use, can bisect because it will automatically extract some information. And you can plug in other tools too, like sending emails when, uh, where to, the peop to the guy who committed the, the first bad commit, or, or integrate it with other tools like Bugzilla and so on. And there is a Git builder tool that automatically build, test, and bisect all the branches you send it, all, all the branches that developer create on their own machine, they can send it to a, a, buff, a buffer repository using Git Builder, and it will be automatically bisected if there are problems. And this buffer can be used by integration people to decide if they want to to integrate branches that have been created. So there is also git replace that can make your, your commit history much more testable and bisectable because in case of untestable areas, well, you, one good way to work around them is to create fixed up branches where you work around the, the breakage, and then you bisect on them. But as you can see, these branches is not connected to the rest of the graph. So this can be a problem if you have to bisect again in the same area. And so what you can do is, is that uh, you can use git replace to, to tell to, in fact, uh, make the, the rest of the graph connected to your new fixed up branch. And um, so it's quite new, but it can be interesting if you want to improve the bisectability of your, your history. So git bisect does not work really well on sporadic bugs. But uh, there are some experimental projects like BBChop and some ideas around that I was too lazy to implement. So, <laughs> and uh, a few statistics about Git bisect usage. So it, you can see that 
there are user surveys each year about how people use Git. And uh, you can see that 80% of the nearly now 9,000 people who answered the survey say they use Git Bisect. And in last year, it was even nearly 50%, and the, the year before, 26. So we can see that many, many Git users are aware about Git Bisect, but the problem is that they don't use it really often. So it can be because they, they don't find it necessary to use it often, or can, it can mean that they have not already integrated it in their workflow. They use it when they, when they find, sometimes when they find it cool to, to try. And um, so we saw that Git Bisect can work really well with test suites and general best practices, and that it can be worth to use a special workflow, and also that it already works very well and is used a lot and very useful. And for this last point, I will again quote Ingo Molnar, who said uh, that it saves him a really lot of time. And before Git Bisect, well, he spent days to sort out patches to do some kind of bisection by hand. And um, with Git Bisect, it's only 20 to 30 minutes, in the best case, completely automated. So he has nothing to, to do when he has launches, launched it. And uh, so, so he says that it's invaluable because there were some bugs he didn't even try to debug. And so he said it's unconditional goodness. So I have to thank many people, uh, especially Junior Mano, Ingol Molnar, Linus, and many other people in the Git and Linux community, and uh, also GTech organizer, attendants, and, if, and all of you for listening to me. Do you have questions? <laughs> oh, yes. Um. Okay, so if you for some silly reason would have really big changes, uh, is there some way to kind of backfit and retro split up a change in smaller pieces so you can have more advantage of this thing? Yes, of course. Uh, if, you, if you find the first bad commit and you find that it, it's too big to be interested, you, you can just create a branch like in the untestable case, you, you can just create a, a new branch where you split the commit into many commits, and then you bisect on this new branch. So it's no problem. Sorry? I, I don't hear you. It's, uh, it's manual. He's asking. Is yes, it manual? it's manual, but uh, <laughs> splitting commits, uh, well, cannot be easily done automatically, you know? Uh, because there is a logic, and uh, so you you have to take care about your history. But once you have done that, well, you can use git replace if you want. So next time you won't have to to do that. If this commit really was a big problem, then next time it won't be an, a big problem. Any other questions? Uh, just a, a thought. I mean, uh, I'd like to uh, kind of clarify. Uh, is uh, so. What we do is that uh, 
when we have to kind of uh, uh, do this kind of analytics to find out which commit created a problem. So, uh, so essentially in the test, uh, uh, test harness and test framework, so every test has a metadata, every test execution run has, a, has its own metadata, and every run's report has its own metadata. So if we can, what we do is, if we kind of meta tag all these three attributes, and we maintain uh, 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 that metadata, if, if, if a, if a, if a uh, uh, test fails, then we do not kind of uh, run the every test again, Instead, we start backporting through this metadata and see which commit failed. So, is this a lighter way of uh, doing things rather than running the exact test again? Uh, sorry, I, I did not understand very well. Uh, you, what what kind of program is it? Uh, I, so, so uh, 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 the question is that. Uh, uh, to find, to reach the exact commit which introduced the regression. Yes. Uh, do you actually run tests? Yes, yes, of course. But so, uh, what I was trying to ask is, can we reach there without running tests if we maintain a good metadata on uh, the test execution runs and test itself? No, you, you have to run tests, but you can run only the test case that you are interested in at each step. and. Uh, you know, even when there are a really big number of commits, as it's a kind of binary search, uh, it's, it, it's quite fast because uh, you, you, have, you have to test only uh, something like 15 commits on, a, on the Linux kernel, which is not a lot. Because there are really a, a, lot, no, a, a lot of commits much more than, uh, than 15, many more. Okay, nope. thank you very much again.